pam 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 welcome to the reimagined payments podcast uh, this is a third take uh, of the reimagined payments podcast uh, my name is peter george um, and i lead uh, amazon payment services for the middle east and africa markets um the podcast series um, uh, that we created within the company was actually to try and drive a series of insightful conversations with thought leaders and leaders of industry uh, within the mina region and i have one such leader with me today but before i introduce her um, any further um i must call out that um she is a well known face in the in the, in the payments industry um she is a face and a force to be reckoned with as well as i have experienced in the last couple of years i've been with uh but before i talk further about her own credits uh, on a professional side i do want to call out something that um that touched me on a very personal side as well um and if i were to flash back um to 2021 september uh, i'm brand new to dubai i'm literally a week old in dubai and the lady in question um spinged uh, my partnerships leader through her team and said she wanted to come over to meet me and i said okay i'm i'm one week old in the company i'm one week old in the role I've absolutely figured out my gig as such over here and um, she comes over with her own team and all she wanted to do was to welcome me to Dubai and I thought that was one of the most warm and hospitable um reach outs that I've ever experienced by any leader that I've met with uh, in the realm and in the in the in the in the space over here and in the capacity that I'm I'm with as well and I've always um, kept that as a as a calling card uh, for the individual I'm going to be talking to in a minute or so um the lady in question that i have with me today is dr saida jafar um dr saida leads uh, visa's efforts across the middle east uh, in the gcc re- region um um saida first of all thank you so much for coming and thank you for making the time to join us today pleasure thank you for having me here i but this thing about uh, us meeting in way back in september is something i always recount um to be at my leaders when they come and visit um be it uh, my own team uh and saying that that's the sense of generosity of spirit and that's the hospitality that um I've come to now expect from <laughs> most people I meet or meet with and said if a lady as senior as Saida can come by and say hi just to say welcome to the region um and of course we've had multiple business conversations yeah. after as well um i just felt that that i thought was a true calling card uh, for a emirati hospitality for lack of other words thank you i actually remember that very very well <laughs> yes i remember going into that meeting and peter was like i'm not sure what exactly is going on why we're meeting but it it was wonderful it was it too. was and you were new to role as well I at that was. time right you were about a month or two in i was just about a month, month just a little month over in? a month old so yeah but 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 for the people who are uh, listening in and watching us today i must introduce um, dr saida for a quick minute as well um now dr saida has um, been in leadership positions for over 20 years um she provides strategic solutions she leads a team that works across the region um and her multifaceted team that i've had the pleasure to work with um are super engaged in kind of driving fintech and payments uh, and to the next level with visa Um she's on the board of trustees at the Kuwait University. She's had uh, a career spanning multiple financial institutions. She's worked with consulting companies like McKinsey and Bain. Um but what also stood out for me was and something I must talk to you about maybe outside of the podcast is that she has a bachelor's degree in biomedical from Boston University yeah. and then a master's degree and a PhD in chemical engineering and now she's in payments. This, uh, <laughs> this 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 transition is something that I must talk about. I, I, I'm an engineer too, but yes. I'm I'm in payments myself. But I've, I've I must I, I I didn't know this transition until the team told me about uh, all the moves that you had made and now to lead Visa in this region is is fascinating. How did you come across payments, uh, Saida? You know, it's a it's a matter of just doing what you love to do, <laughs> and then life just takes its course. Life happens. Exactly, life <laughs> just happens. Um, I've always loved math. Okay. as a kid as growing up i've loved math i've enjoyed it every single minute of it and after after high school i started university and initially oh. i actually thought i was going to be a medical doctor but i through my biomedical engineering realized i loved engineering a lot more than the biomedical wow. part so i just pursued a path in engineering and uh, chemical engineering was something that was just very interesting to me because True. i've i've always loved the chemistry part of it uh-huh. too uh-huh. and the engineering part um so i just kept going and kept going and l- loved doing what i was doing 
And uh, when it was time to graduate and, you know, as my parents say, finally get into the world, um, I looked at multiple things and I was very blessed that a lot of incredible organizations recruited from my university. And um, I spoke to a number of different folks that showed up, a lot Mm. of my, uh, my, who would be my future colleagues, a lot of my friends. And consulting just seemed like a natural extension. Got it. Because it's built around problem solving. True. And it didn't matter what problem you were solving. You were going to apply a, a, let's say, a business version of the scientific method to solving a problem. And that was very exciting to me. Nice. So I started out in consulting. And uh, like any good consultant, I thought, hey, I'll do this until I figure out what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, so this was McKinsey. This was McKinsey. This was McKinsey. But it's interesting. You did a doctorate as well in uh, in in chemical engineering. I did, isn't it? Yes. and then shifted to McKinsey to do. But what did you? Do? What were you at in McKinsey? So when I first started at McKinsey, I was in the pharmaceuticals practice because my my uh, doctorate was. Um, it was using nanoparticles for gene therapy. So it oh was my. a combination. Oh <laughs> talk, about, talk about diversity. <laughs> it was interesting. It was very interesting, but it was more for the biomedical applications oh. and for therapeutic applications, which is why when I first joined McKinsey, I said, hey, this is very interesting because it's somehow related to something I did and it's, uh, it, could be very, it could be a lot of uh, fun. And I did that for about a year. But at McKinsey, it's uh, one of the things I love about that place is you go in and you are, you have to try different things. You cannot specialize too early. So I did many, many things. Mm-hmm. And through that, realized I actually loved the financial services aspect. Interesting. A lot. So you chanced upon this uh, industry. As I actually. did. I did. Because, you, again, in the beginning, you have to try many things. And I just, I loved it. And I loved the the change that I was going through. And I loved the people that, were, uh, that I was working with. So I just kept on working. And I just kept on working more and more in financial services. And payments is such a core part of financial of services. Of and that just kind of went on and uh, for many, many years. And uh, at some point... Uh, you know, a visa happened and uh, it's one of those things, right? Again, just the best things in life happen when you don't expect them to happen. That's brilliant. No, but the best things happen to people who keep their eyes open as well. And it's interesting, the manner in which you spoke about the diversity of things that you've done and how it kind of opens up new doors for you as well, right? And now visa is where you're at and you lead such a big setup over here in visa within the GCC. So all of GCC is basically your, your responsibility. Um, which is which is just brilliant um, to see that you've come to this stage. But it's also something I wanted to talk of as well, um, Saida, uh, in the sense that when you look um, across the ecosystem in UAE, um, you see very few women leaders of your stature and standing um, who run industries and companies as such, right? So if I were to talk about, um, you know, a few uh, within the systems over here, we have Donna Benton who runs uh, The Entertainer right now. Um, You have Lena Khalil who is a founder at Mums World. And now we have you, uh, another senior leader at Visa who runs all of GCC. But in your journey as as a leader to where you are, the fact that you are an Emirati woman as well, how did that play out uh, in the, I'm, I'm trying to get it to, why don't we have more women leaders uh, running businesses and industries over here? Yeah. How is it that you stood out as a, as a, as a, as a, trailblazer, as a trailblazer of sorts uh, amongst women? Uh, and what, what, what got you here? Yeah. Uh, it, Look, I would love to say I'm a trailblazer, but the reality is there have been many other successful women sure. before me. And I think even around me. And, and, and I think we're, blessed to be living in a place and in times where women are given every opportunity that a man is given. And it, yes, there's still a lot more that needs to be done and that can happen. But I think it's just just incredible to see what's happening in yeah. our part of the world compared to perhaps other places. Um, again, I've I've been very blessed in many ways. Uh, I grew up in a family, so I'm the youngest child. I'm the only girl. I have okay. uh, three older brothers. Okay. And uh, I was very blessed to go up in a family like that where in some ways it really didn't matter that I was a girl, right? I mean... I mean, you have three older brothers, brother, I guess. It, one, it's, one of us is four then. <laughs> you get used to dealing with, <laughs> sure, uh, sure. with guys, right? When you have three older yeah. brothers who are quite a bit older than you are. And uh, it was um, it was never done in our house that, uh, you know, because they were all really good at math. So it was never that 
oh, it's okay, you don't, do, you don't need to do well, you're a girl. No, 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 never, never. That was not accepted, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you got a 99, why don't you get a 100? Come on, that's, you know, okay. you got a 100, why don't you get a 105? <laughs> that kind of stuff, so. <laughs> well, 100, 500, okay, let's stop. You should have done extra credit. There was an extra credit. You should have put it in anyways, so. Got it, got it. Which is fine, which is. So super which high is, standard, basically. <laughs> and I think that's the role parents can also play, of right? Course. They can just say, you should never compromise. You should never say, it's okay to not perform at your best. You should always push yourself more. And I think if parents set that standard at home, mm -hmm. I think kids just inevitably grow up grow with up using that. using the same standards. And, uh, and, and there was never any expectation that you want to work, you don't want to work. It's your sure. choice. Sure. And, I, and I think the freedom to have that choice, both for men and women, I think is critical in today's world. Very true. And again, as we, as we grow up and we grow up and we enter environments and, and organizations where these choices are openly talked about and openly celebrated, I think it becomes increasingly important. That's true, very true. So would you, have then, would you then accredit companies like Visa and McKinsey and all the other companies that you've worked with to be the forerunners for diversity and inclusion and so on and so forth? Would that be something that also calls out and stands out and that helped you to where you are right now? Absolutely, and I think, uh, Visa is probably one of the most diverse places that I've worked at. Sure. And what's really interesting is we can always talk about, you know, the gender diversity. Yeah. That's one aspect of, of it. But I think there's so many other elements 100%. of equity and diversity. And I'll, I'll, I'll actually share something with Please. you. Um, Visa was just awarded by His Highness uh, something called a parent-friendly label. It's a very, very prestigious award and it was only awarded to very few organizations okay. in the UAE. But what it is, it's a recognition by the president of the country, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, about, around organizations that are wow. really creating the environment and policies for parents. parents. And in, I mean, if you link this back to what I said earlier, given how important parents are, if you are in an organization that doesn't recognize that mm -hmm. you as a parent need mm -hmm. to be spending time at home, how are you going to raise that that next generation? How will you empower all and, and just get the best out of the kids? Sure. So it's it's so important to be able to create that right environment. And 100%, I mean, Visa so the, is just an the, incredible place. The culture of the organization, basically. And that that's brilliant. I mean, congratulations to both you and Thank the team you. at Visa for the for this super recognition. But if I were to again zoom out, um, say that from the from from the from the payments industry as such, mm -hmm. is payments a space or a payments a landscape that actually can promote uh, diversity and help more women come to the come to the fore as leaders like you? Sure, I think payments is one of those very interesting industries that is built on diversity. Why because, do you say that? And that's interesting. Because if you think about payments, what's the one thing we always say about payments? Payments are local. Yeah, that's true. Right? Very true. Payments the are local diverse. Is, the more relevant it the is. The more local it is, the more relevant it is. Absolutely. What works for, you know, in one country may or may not work in another 100%, country. Right? 100%. What may work in a certain part of a country doesn't necessarily work in another part of the country. Very true. So, you know, I mean, just simple things like, uh, you know, tap to phone. If you yeah. look at tap to phone, yeah. uh, I can tap my phone in certain countries easily yep. in certain parts of the country. Yep. I go yep. to another part of the country, I have to get my plastic out, right? And and so it's just it's so so localized mm -hmm. that I would that the need for diversity is paramount. I, I don't think it's optional. Got it. So diversity in payments is something that actually fosters payments and that gets it even accelerating faster. That, that's super interesting, um, I'll tell you that. But how, how, how are you driving more of this with other ecosystem partners? Uh, I, I know there's this great initiative that you have, uh, it's called She's Next. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about that as well? Uh, Absolutely. So She's Next is a phenomenal platform that we have and that we've been lucky enough to build with our partners. And what we do through She's Next, She's Next is a program where we actually um, bring in a lot of women entrepreneurs, uh -huh. entrepreneurs and businesses that are, are women-led. And the idea is to bring them in and to, to showcase them and select a few that will then go through a year-long program with us. And Excellent. they go through training, they go through coaching, mentoring, they get a grant, and they're able to plug into our ecosystem. 
and wherever it uh, wherever we can leverage their services, wherever we can provide them with some uh, you know with additional let's say uh, ways to further their business, mm-hmm. we do, and we also work with our partners. Who that's brilliant, the I mean, and this is something that I would love to kind of talk to you maybe after the podcast as well, because I was told about she's next when. Um, my own country leader in Saudi, Mona Al Samin, yes. uh, attended She's Next with your team over there as well. Correct. Um, and she spoke very highly about um, She's Next and how Amazon Payment Services could work with Visa as well in the future. So we should talk about this. We, uh, we should absolutely talk should. about it. So this year we did a She's Next platform across every single GCC country. Mm-hmm. We got close to a thousand applications. Wow. So it's absolutely a phenomenal platform and we should talk about what hundred percent, one hundred percent. But that's that's it's it's interesting that he speaks so much about the diversity and the fact that being local adds and adds greater diversity and therefore greater means to kind of pay. But on the same point as well, um, Saida, something that stood out for me, and, and now that I've moved from India, it, it's relevant in India too, is that there is this huge population or populace of consumers and even businesses which are not completely in the banked space as much, right? Yeah. Uh, and if we were to talk about diversity from that perspective as well, yeah. there's a lot of work that you folks are doing as well in driving diversity and more financial yeah. inclusion. Can you tell me more about why is there such a disparity in the region? UAE, for example, is overbanked. Um, there are parts of North Africa, say Egypt, where it's yeah. underbanked. So why yeah. is there this disparity? Yeah. What, what's your read of the matter? Again, payments are local. Okay. Right. Banking is local. It's it's a very local uh, ecosystem that needs to plug into a very yeah. global ecosystem. Is perhaps I would think of it, right? right? And it's that that connectivity and that interface that has to work. So it it's just it's a it's a it, it's a balancing act, is how I would think of it. Right. Um, if I step back and think about what you the fundamental question you asked, right, which is around. Why are there yeah. underpopular? Why are the underserved Underst- areas? Underserved, let's yeah. put it that way. I think on both the individual side as well as on the business side, there are still uh, there are still large pockets that don't necessarily get what they need to become a part of the financial fold. They so don't get what they need uh, to become uh, to be a part yeah, of the, the uh, financial well, ecosystem. When you say they don't get what they need, um, can you can you tell me more about that particular part? Sure. So uh, l- let's take maybe SMEs as sure. an example, right? Sure. In SMEs today, it's uh, there's still a lot of cash, yep. for example, that is used uh, in the SME ecosystem Got it. simply because, partly because that's traditional, that's historic, it's legacy, but also because they don't necessarily have the same the same tools that we've used to scale with the larger parts of the market. Mm-hmm don't necessarily always work in that segment. Therefore, there is need for innovation. There is need for bringing some new solutions. I know, for example, we have a partnership where we take very specific and customized solutions, right? Both for online, but also for face-to-face, offline offline. transactions. And these are things like, just one example, right? As opposed to using a traditional point of sale device, use your phone. Absolutely. And your phone can actually be, uh, can double as your point of sale device. And off of the back of that, you can put on a bunch of value added services on there, you know, in terms of accounting, in terms of billing, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, order management. So there's so much else that can be baked into that. So the needs of the SMEs are fundamentally different. Sure. And then the needs of the larger players. And hence, customizing the solutions for those SMEs basically is how you... But um, Saida, again, um, given that there is this diversity, let me ask you a very fundamental question, maybe sure. more for my own learning as well. Is there a need to kind of have more and more people in the financial inclusion, digital and financial inclusion bandwagon yeah. versus continuing to stay on with the cash regime, yeah. so to speak? Is, yeah. is that something that you believe we should be working towards on. I know you and I, I mean, our teams work on this. Yeah. We collaborate so closely with Visa on so many of these SME initiatives. We also work with AWS to provide cloud services. We do. In fact, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and I could have, I wanted to do a demo for you today was how we are trying to, we are trying to innovate right. on payments with Alexa, our voice services right. as well, right? So Alexa in certain countries can actually be spoken to to pay for you on your mm-hmm. behalf as well. So Alexa then plugs in and we work with Deva over here, for example, to pay Deva bills just using Alexa. So yes. beyond phone, beyond tap and pay, yes. beyond plastic, we're talking about voice to make payments as well, right? Yeah. But what do you believe, uh, why do we need to get more people into the digital bandwagon? Why, why is that the need? 
It's a very good question, right? And, and I'll give you some anecdotal, uh, I guess, examples for this as well. Time and time again, research as well as experience shows that when an organization or a business is able to accept a finance or a, a, a uh, digital form of payment, uh-huh. be it online or in person, they are able to drive and deliver better business results. Interesting. Take COVID as an example, okay. right? Overnight, our habits changed. We stopped physically visiting stores sure. and moved to online. Amazon. There you go. <laughs> you don't need me to tell you that, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Now, imagine a retailer who was not able to be on the Amazon platform or any other digital platform. Yep. Well, how are they going to reach their customers? Yeah. Payment is fundamental, absolutely fundamental to facilitating the digital customer experience. Right? Right. So that's that's just the, the digital part. And today, if you look at it, I mean, our numbers show that, you know, north of 35 percent of commerce is digital commerce. Mm. It's mm. e-commerce in this part of the world mm. and growing, which is growing, growing, growing. I'm sure you have your own estimates, right? Absolutely. But it's so, Absolutely. so without that be the ability to accept digital payments, you're more or less cut out of that ecosystem. Yes, I know there are some some forms of cash on delivery, but those are still very limited and those are, are not very, very optimal, right? So, so that's one part. But then if I flip to the other part and I say, okay, what about face-to-face? Because fine, let's say 35 is e There's still 65. That's not e That's mm-hmm. face-to-face. Mm-hmm. So what about that? Even in that, people's preferences have changed. Okay. So we have research that, that t- indicates that it's not even about digital payments. It's about experiential payments in today's world. Experiential store. payments, okay. Experiential payments. So when I go, I don't want to st- uh, to a store. I don't want to cry, you know, pull necessarily pull out my plastic mm. and swipe or mm. tap or dip. I just want to use my phone. Yeah, yeah. Right? 98% of face-to-face transactions that are tokenized are tapped. Tap on phone. Are tapped on phone in the region. So it's, it's one of the highest in the world. Mm-hmm. So... There is a move away, even from even on that. So now imagine cash, and you remember again around COVID, there were all these issues around. This, is it is cash? Go, is it dirty? Is yeah, it yeah, you know yeah, yeah, germs and all of germs that? Germs and so on. So That's yeah. one part. You know, we are blessed to live in a place where we don't have to worry about the physical security and safety. Very but true. in many places, you have to worry about that. You know, you lose your money, or somebody sure. takes the money from you. It's gone. It's For done. Sure. Sure. So there's a lot of elements around there that, again, from a consumer's perspective, mm-hmm. make me more make me lean more towards digital payments, even in face to face environments. So overall. If a business is not able to tap into that, is not able to give the consumer that choice and that ability, they will lose Makes out. Sense. But um, so you know, on the same point, um, what are you and what is your team at Visa doing to drive more around? Um, <clears throat> the point here is that if, it, if I were to just, again, look at the UAE landscape, right, mm-hmm. where we have so many migrant workers, come, people from other countries who come here and work, the blue collar workers, we call them the gig economy and such. How do you move those and what incentives are you providing them to change their patterns of behavior? Because I, I can tell you when I shifted from India, I used to use credit cards in India, mm. the physical plastic. And when I came here is when I shifted over to using my Apple Pay uh, yeah. phone, right? On, yeah. on my phone. Um, I, that was a big yeah. transition for me and it's super convenient. So I have, my, are local. I have my visa cards loaded, payments yeah. are local, I've shifted over, I'm a convert, yeah. right? Yeah. Now when I go, I always ask them saying, do you have a phone tap, a tap on pay? Um, but how do you change this behavior? You change that for me, and I, I think I'm a little more tech savvy than most. But that said, how do you change behavior at large, such large scale? What are you doing? What are the incentives that you're driving, uh, programs that you're driving to kind of enhance this behavior? Sure. I think there are many, many things um, that uh, so you're absolutely right. I think there are still many pockets mm-hmm. that are not quite as digitized sure. and that are used to the more uh, le- traditional and legacy ways of working. And I think a lot of it has to do with people's safety, security, yep, peace yep, of yep, mind, absolutely. right? Where um, I just don't know what's going to happen on Very the true. other side. Very and true. and I'll, I'll, again, I'll give you an example, right? I mean, um, our, our nanny is from the Philippines. Mm-hmm. She sends money home all the time. She was sharing that one of her friends had just moved to Dubai mm-hmm. and she was trying to send money back home and she sent it on the wallet back home, but she mistyped the number. Ooh. Money's gone. Oh boy. Okay. Right. And it's her first salary. 
That's so painful. it's very painful. So then she comes to me and she says, you know, had I sent it through uh, another mean, perhaps that wouldn't have happened. Mm. The reality is uh, there are pros and cons, right? But getting understanding responsibly how to use digital payments can yeah. make life a lot easier. It can facilitate things a lot more because, again, the same transaction could have been done in 30 seconds had it been done the right way, Got it. money would have gotten there. You won't have to go somewhere, and all the other elements are the, uh, would would work around it. So there is a massive element of learning that Got needs it. to be put into place, and it's scary mm. for people who are not used to it, right? Sure, and sure. it, it's very scary because what if you make a mistake? The chance, you know, the 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 uh, what, the said their response can be pretty daunting. So we spend a lot of time on educational programs. We spend a lot of time on many things. And and one of the largest programs that we run is, run is something called Stay Secure. Okay. Stay Secure is not just for the migrant workers. It's for everyone. Anyone. Right? How many times do you get a call or a message or something where somebody's trying to get something from you? Right? Which one? Absolutely. All the time. I mean, I got a call two days ago from the central bank, supposedly, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Asking for my Emirates ID because my KYC was... The same uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. It's, it's that, there's so many of these things that happen. So it's an L, it's a matter of continuous learning, continuous education. So we spend a lot of time and we spend a lot of efforts with our partners mm. across the world. So in the UAE, we partner with uh, the Dubai the Police. We partner with many, many different organizations on continuously educating our customers and making them aware of fraud, of making them aware of of uh, other challenges because we have to be vigilant. Yep. And now with the advent of new technologies, with AI, with all the other things coming in, we have to step it up. Even, even more. more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It can happen anywhere. We have to be it's, it's beyond vigilant. It's getting scary for lack of other words. But it's interesting that you, you mentioned that as well because on one side you have so much of proliferation of technology, AI mm -hmm. and um, that particular space as such. And then you have all the work that you are doing as well to kind of get more people into the financial inclusion um, space as such. But how about, um, now that was about the unbanked as such, but let's talk about people who are familiar with um, mm -hmm. payment technologies. Um, yeah. And this ecosystem in this region has been the hotbed of technology and yeah. innovation. Do you want to talk more about that as well, uh, Saida, in terms of how you... How is Visa and your your charter at Visa helping drive that part of the world as well? Sure. What are you doing over there? Sure. So I think in terms of the future of payments, in terms of the innovation that we see, I think there's three big themes mm -hmm. that are in our mind, right? So I think first and foremost, there's still a ton of cash that we think is going to continue to be displaced. So in the GCC region, there's probably about 65% of the cash that's already been digitized. I see. Flip side is, is 30 plus percent that yet, yet remains. Yep. And there are specific use cases, specific areas. So I think there's still a lot of room on digitizing that cash. There are some countries where this number is close to like 95 plus percent, right? Sure. So we just, I think there's still quite a bit of headway there. And I expect we will continue to see much more digitization of cash, mm -hmm. targeting specific use cases, such as, I'll give you an example, rent. Mm. Right. Rent is is perhaps it's more check based. Right. It's not yet pure digital. So I think you'll will continue to see these. I think Saudi recently passed a law which said that they had to be used a certain portal for sure. it. So I think, again, we'll continue to see more and more of this certain pockets of of, let's say, non pure digital payments that are going to be digitized. Got That's it. the first way. I think the second thing that we're going to see is a proliferation in alternate payment methods. Interesting. And this is something uh, that I know we've, that's been super interesting and critical in our part of the world. So take, for example, things like uh, installments or buy now, pay later. Buy now, pay later, yeah. Right. Yeah. Today, buy now, pay later is doing incredibly well in our part of the world. Consumers really enjoy and appreciate the convenience, right? The visibility, the predictability of uh, having recurring payments. Mm -hmm. It's easier for a certain group of customers, not all, but a certain group of customers to have that. It is, in fact, something we deeply, deeply believe in as Visa. And uh, we are right now working with our entire ecosystem on making sure every Visa credential becomes 
uh, something that you can do an installment on. Nice. So you are focusing on installments in a big way as well then? Absolutely. This is, I mean... Because one of my my past um, 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 guest of mine over here at the, at the podcast was Hossam Arab. Yes. Um, the founder CEO of Tabi, right? Of and uh, the charter that he runs is so fascinating. And I've always been in super admiration about the work that they do at Tabi and other entities in the region over here, like yeah. Tamara and such as yes. well, right? Um, but it's interesting that you spoke about installments as well, Saida. What are you doing around installments? What's Visa's charter with installments and BNPL? Sure. So I think we do a couple of different things. So Tabi is a great partner of ours, sure. and you know we work with Tabi and the other BNPL players on making sure they're able to convert what they have as a closed loop system into an open loop yep. system, right? So that's one element of what we do, and we, you know. I think Tabby has, as you said, had some really, really interesting and phenomenal success in this. So that's one part. I think the other part of what we're doing is uh, to give each and every consumer the ability to make a choice mm -hmm. at the point of sale and say, I will purchase, let's say, a TV or you know, furniture or whatever it is. And at the point of sale, I will decide whether I want to use my revolving line of credit mm -hmm. for the sale or if I want to make this on an installment basis. Got it. So at the point of sale, I will get so a more message. More choices. And more choices. And exactly. More, more choices, more, more predictability, more uh, flexibility. So I can stand up and say, you know what? I actually want to, this thing that I just bought, I want to pay it off in, the, in four easy installments over the next 12 months. There's the option. That's how much it'll cost. Check. Done. So this is actually something we're working on today, and nice. you will uh, you've seen. I know some, we've been speaking about yeah, it as well. We've been I, I know about we, it. We, we got stuff to do on that one uh, we, for sure. We, we do, we do, and uh, but you, I mean the ecosystem is starting to get lit up here. You got know, it. There was some. This was in the press a couple a month or so ago. You will see a lot more activity on Excellent. this in the coming months. No, but I, I I love the focus over here as well, Saida, from the fact that uh, in with Visa as with successful companies like Visa or Amazon and so on and so forth, the focus on consumer convenience uh, and narrowing down on the requirements that they go through is exactly what Hossam also spoke about as well. Tapping into that need makes yes. a company um, that much more successful, right? Absolutely. We live in a world where, you know, we, we, we're not short of choices. Mm. Fundamentally, it's up to me as a consumer to decide how and where I want to spend my time, my yeah. attention, and my money. Yep. So the more that that organizations focus on providing the consumer the choice and making the experience for the consumer easier, better, more engaging, more interactive, more experiential, yep, yep, the yep. better and, and more, the better the financial results. Awesome, awesome. Um, one more um, so-called serious question. If you had a, yeah. uh, a soothsayer's gift, so to speak, to kind of think over the future, what's your forecast for 24 and beyond in terms of what's going to happen in this region that we should watch out for in the payment space, of course? Of course. Uh, what do you believe is going to happen within the UAE, within Saudi? There's a lot of talk about Saudi uh, and UAE uh, having a lot of tourists coming in and so on and so forth. Well, yeah. What's your take with payments as a lens on top of it all? Absolutely. So, look, I think uh, let's talk about both the domestic part as well as the sure. tourist part, right? I think the domestic part is strong and it will continue to perform very, very strongly. So the expectation for 24 is, you know, people will continue to spend more, especially on experiential yeah. as opposed to purely material things. Uh, so restaurants, uh, you know, movies, concerts, you name it. So it's just sure. more about living your life and having those experiences. I think that will continue. And things will become more, much more digital and, and consumers will almost pick different payment options based on whatever it is that they're choosing to do at that moment. Mm -hmm. So that's one big part. I think the other part that you touched upon is on the uh, tourism side. Yep. We have been blessed with tourism. So if you look at it, the, the, we just published some numbers, right? The Bay had, what, 17 plus million tourists yep, in yep, the yep. last year. I think Saudi uh -huh. published numbers was about 27 20 million. 27 million? 27 wow. million, something Staggering. along those lines. Yeah, international tourists. With, I mean, the, the ambition is to get to 70 million international by 2030, 150 total by 2030 in Saudi. So it's just, I think, incredibly vibrant markets yeah. for tourists. Very true. And one of the things we see increasingly is that this cross-border component in commerce and payments is going to become increasingly important. Cross-border payments. Cross-border. And, and let me explain what I mean by Please. that, right? More tourists come into the country, uh -huh. right? Be it UAE, be Saudi, be it wherever. 
they come in with their local payment methods. Absolutely. Those local payment methods need to work here. Very true. Very true. That's one of the beauties of having a visa credential. doesn't matter where in where the world you are. Completely. It will work. If you're at a point of sale that accepts visa, it will work. So, so seamless, again. It's seamless. So a little earlier you spoke about affordability at the point of sale. Now you're talking about seamlessness at the point of sale as well. Correct. Which is, which is what the charter has, seems to be a visa, right? Make it more convenient, make it more affordable. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. I mean, but please, I'm Absolutely. sorry I interrupted you because no, I, no. I was just excited about what you just spoke about. <laughs> no, but that's exactly right, right? So it's about people coming in. Yep, it's yep. equally about people going out, yeah. right? We all travel and we're all been traveling a lot, a lot more, even for personal reasons uh, since COVID. That's not coming down anytime soon. Sure. When we go somewhere, I want that to work, right? We were in Jordan not too long ago, somewhere in the mountains, and there were these tiny little uh, kiosks, for okay. lack of a better word. Okay. And, you know, they had a big sign which says, we proudly accept Excellent visa. visa. Excellent. Yeah. In fact, Excellent. it was so beautiful. I remember I took a photo of it and I, I, I posted it and we just got some like incredible responses to that. But that's, that's exactly it, right? That's and, not, and that does two things, right? So first, if I want to pay, I'm able to pay. Yeah. But even more than that, when I see that, I say, okay, there's an element of trust here. Trust. trust. Right? Yep. There's an Absolutely. element of trust. It's safe. Yep. I can go in there and I can use my card and or my credential and... It, I, I won't, uh, I'll be fine. I'll be safe. So I think there's that element. But then there's also, again, let's not forget the online world. Mm -hmm. In the online world, increasingly cross-border is coming into play, mm -hmm. right? Increasingly, there are small individuals uh, as well as larger organizations such as Amazon where I want to order something. So many times I order stuff from the U.S., from elsewhere, comes in, arrives seamlessly, my payment is accepted. So again, online world, offline it. world, it doesn't matter. It is becoming Make it as seamless as possible, make it as convenient and affordable. Yeah. That seems and to be the commonality. Safe, yeah. safe of course. Safe. Of course, of course. Absolutely. So Saida, before I uh, let you off the hook, um, just a couple of questions more. Um, of a little more off the payments radar at least, right? Um, my, my team insisted I should ask and put Dr. S Dr. Saida on the spot, at least on this one. If if you could um, opt to have uh, dinner with any historical figure, uh, who would it be and why? It would be Einstein. Dr. Albert Einstein. Dr. Albert Einstein. Okay. How does this work out for you? <laughs> is, is it the biomedical part or is it the I, is I just find him chemistry? fascinating. I mean, of course, obviously, I've never met him, but I just think everything about him that I know that I've read is just fascinating. And, you know, how he went from uh, clerking for the patent office to just being one of the most brilliant and influential minds that has defined so many things in today's world it's just unbelievable. And to just get a few moments with him to wow. try and understand that a little bit, and maybe some of it will rub off on me. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Come but on, you need more of it rubbing off on you. <laughs> Aren't you a successful leader as it is? <laughs> no, but that, that's what I would love to do. That's brilliant. And um, the last point that um, at least a couple of, I, 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 my, my head of marketing is a, is a woman leader, Kalika Tripathi, ex-visa, by the way. Um, Kalika insisted that I should ask you this as well. If you had another role or any role at all um, that you could kind of don beyond the role that you're at right now, what would it be and what would me give you the most gratification? I think the best role that I've ever had and that I probably will ever have is being a mother. Being a mom, okay. Yes. I, I have one kid. I have okay. a 10-year-old boy okay. and he's the absolute joy of uh, my life and of a lot of people's lives. And I don't think anything else compares or even comes close. I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. I think I have the best job in the world with Visa. For sure. But what I think is the most satisfying role I would have ever played in my life, being a mom. There we go. I mean, that's brilliant. That's excellent. A mom and a business leader as well. But thank you so much, uh, Saida. This was brilliant chatting with you. Um, I, I, I do I want to thank you once again for coming in and for chatting up with me. And I'm sure the people who are going to check this out podcast Thank out later you. are going to really be grateful for all the all the insights that you brought to the table pleasure um but yeah it was as always brilliant um thank you again Saida. thank you peter always great chatting with you